Well, thank everyone for joining. We're having a little technical difficulty. I think Rose is having some, some issues maybe with her internet, but we will get started um, as soon as we have sorted those. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us on the Drawn in Conversation series here on Instagram. This is episode 29, which is very surprising. Episode 29, lucky 29. Um, and if you have joined us here previously, you have been uh, wonderfully entertained by our former director, Kate Mason, um, who, um, if you saw our recent announcement, um, has stepped down from her role. Uh, so thank you very much, Kate, for all your wonderful work. Um, it was brilliant working with you. Um, and we recently welcomed Jane Barnes. So welcome, Jane, to the team. Uh, and uh, we will certainly uh, see how things uh, are going um, and well, you know lots of things in the background um, let me just see um, how Rose is doing and we'll see if we can get her back back with us um, do feel free if anyone has any questions or comments in the chat thus far <laughs> do feel free just to just to pop them in and we'll see how we how we go Okay. I think I have a few technical issues. Everyone, if you would just bear with us, we will get this sorted. I would message you, but I can't. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you're fine, you're fine. Um, yeah, I the think you buffered died. a little bit. The connection Oh, died. you're back. It's back again. It's back again. Uh, yes, everyone, you should always make sure your phone is charged before you join an Instagram live. Instagram, it really does drain the battery, though. You know, I think it's uh, this, this, just all the, all the things going on. Um, well, welcome. We made it. Yes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. They had a whole spiel about me chatting about the big draw. We can just... Hi, Lorna. <laughs> People are saying hello to me. <laughs> no, like, by all means. By all means, just um, have, a, have a look at the, 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 the comments in the chat. Yes, so welcome, everyone. Um, the wonderful Rose Sinclair is with us uh, this evening. Um, lecturer in design at Goldsmiths and co-curator of the wonderful um, Althea McNish Colour is Mine exhibition, which is just leaving the William Morris Gallery. We only have, well, maybe we can be kind and go over the hour by five minutes, but we are, yeah. we were technically for an hour. It's back to 12, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was it. That's yeah, the one. that was it. it. Finishes on Sunday, so if you haven't been, you've only got a couple of more days to go see it. I mean, we'd say go now, but maybe you can go after this. But yes, um, it's closed. Yeah. The, the gallery's closed. <laughs> yeah, we'll just right now. Stay here yeah. and then go before the yeah, yeah before the eleventh. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but you also um, shared some very exciting news with us that we shared as when we were talking about this um, this chat as well. So it's, it's, it doesn't end with the William Morris Gallery, does it? No, the, the, our breaking news is that it's going to the Whitworth in Manchester. So it's going up north and it's going to have much more stuff in it and it's going to be bigger. So if you are up north, you're going to be in for a big treat up in Manchester, which is which is kind of the spiritual home of textiles, if you want to say that. Um, and I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to the next six months of meeting lots of lovely people up in North. Um, and I did my textiles degree at Huddersfield, so I'll probably see some alumni up there as well. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to what the next six months will bring and sharing lots of great stories about Althea and her work. And she actually did a lot of a lot of her early work and a lot of her early successes were in Manchester at um, a lot of the, 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 the with the cotton board and with um, Hollins Thompson through the Terrelin Twal project, where she actually revolutionised how fashion and colour were actually brought together. So, That's fantastic. Because you say it's going to be sorry. bigger, so you're actually physically going to have more room, aren't you? Yeah, well... Anybody that's been to the Whitworth knows that it's a fantastic gallery. It is absolutely massive. And when I walked in, I just went OMG with a couple of other words attached to it. <laughs> um, thinking, thinking, yes, OK, got my, got my work cut out here. But there's a fantastic team and a big shout out to Rowan Bain um, at the William Morris Gallery, plus Amy George, Victoria Hartley and all the team at the Whitworth that are just, oh, it's just, they're just fantastic so yeah big shout out to all the team and all the behind all the people behind the scenes that make this work happen yeah big yeah because it takes so many people to bring these things together um al hamilton brown you have asked a very excellent question what are the dates the dates are october 21st 2022 until april 23rd so you know you can get in there yeah in a matter of weeks so yeah. i'm sure actually you, you must be pretty busy then with this. yes 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 <laughs> well thank you very much for squeezing us in <laughs> a very busy schedule we're very we're very yeah. uh, pleased to have you it'd be yeah, wonderful I think, it's, I think it's great that it starts during black history month because it raises that awareness as well that um here is the first designer of caribbean heritage to be of note within the design sphere international recognition for her work in design and her impact on 20th century postmodern design in Britain. So yeah, a big shout out to those that think that um, black design just happened today. It didn't, it happened 60 years ago. She was doing stuff 60 years ago. That's kind of just makes your, your toes curl. It really does. It does actually. So I think we, we might have jumped a little bit ahead yeah, okay. about the exhibition, but let's just go back a little bit because and, and just kind of set a bit of the grounding around yourself and particularly textile design. Why is that so in, in, in important for you? How did how did that start for you? Um, well, it goes back to my mum, who sadly passed away earlier this year, but it goes back to just being surrounded by textiles. Um, she was a. She came here as a dressmaker. That's what her passport said. Her professional is a professional work was a dressmaker. Mm -hmm. She trained in that back in Jamaica in a little in a parish called Saint Catherine. Grew up in a, a little village called Bellinsgate. So a big shout out to them. Um, if you're if anybody from Jamaica is looking, big shout out to the the that town that little village. Um, but she came here and she actually worked in um, lots of hotels as a um, housekeeping, in housekeeping, but she was doing all the kind of, looking after all the kinds of textiles and doing all the mending, but behind the scenes, she was also doing all the, looking, dressing up, creating all the dresses and clothes for herself, but also within church, she worked behind the scenes in what was called the Dorcas Club. So the Dorcas Club, or anybody that has never heard of Dorcas, Dorcas is in the Bible, and she um, is, den is denoted as the woman who um, is the patron saint of charity, textiles, and she's all denoted as being this woman that took in the destitutes, taught them to be bakers of cloth, so they could then fend for themselves and their families, 
Um, and that just has a special resonance with me about how we use textiles as a ch form of charity. And I grew up with women like my mum all around me doing textiles. And it, for me, it just seemed the thing to go into. Um, my mum would go on to become a nurse in the National Health Service, like so many others of that Windrush generation. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that wasn't my kind of thing. But mum knew I loved art and loved textiles and just encouraged me to do that. And that's been my passion since I was about three or four. And it's never left me. It's fantastic. I've got this amazing image of you and just in the sitting room, just surrounded by all the different materials and fabric and I suppose just all the different um just the real image that would create especially at such a at such a young age as well yeah really. I mean mum taught me to knit when I was about five so and I'm not she had anything. every single sewing machine that there was going I remember the from the little hand one to the treadle one to the electric one to the computerized one so I grew up with machines all around me all the time. So it was, mm. it was like, that was, it was like second nature and seeing, we see so much documentary evidence about um, white women growing up with their mothers and sewing and knitting and, and that not being the norm. But when I talk about my own background or black women growing up, people kind of question that. Was that the norm? Was that normal? Is that normal? I'm going, well, yeah. Why isn't it? Oh, because we don't see it written down. We said, well, it, it does exist. It's written down, but it's just maybe not in the textbooks that we see in our universities and that common knowledge, but it is it is there. And it's now starting to be written about. And I think it's it's time that we acknowledge that there are other other knowledges out there. And other yes, stories really. and other histories. Absolutely. And I think yeah, this is what all our conversations have, have come back to, isn't it? Really like who's telling the stories and, you know, what what do you really actually want to, I suppose, define something as historical accuracy if you don't actually you're not aware of the full scale and breadth and, and you know, every single individual lived experience is always gonna have yeah. kind of different different contexts as well, yeah. especially given what you're what you have read as yeah. well. Um so what for you growing up surrounded by textiles and your mum encouraging you and recognising your love for art, um, at what point did you then move from into, I suppose then you went moved into, to, into your education, into your research and looking into specifically into design and textiles? Um, probably by the time I got to uni, I thought I was going to go and do print because uh, I loved okay. print. And I just got, I think at uni, I just got into knit and I got into yarn. I got into where, where does yarn come from? And in Huddersfield, you could just, you could go, you, they taught you, they, you could actually go and pick your fibre and make your yarn and then knit your cloth. So I got into the provenance of stuff. I got, got into this whole thing of where do you, where does that stuff come from? So from mm. the mid eighties, I was, I ended up being a colourist. So by the time I left uni, I got a job as a colourist designer knit, in knitwear. So I was able to, I was doing trends and all this kind of stuff. So I was able to do, I was doing trend boards and doing stuff for Leicester Yarn Week and Pity for Lati and all that kind of stuff. So I was able to, we were sourcing cashmere and Shetland fibres and all this kind of stuff. So I actually got into this whole thing of where does our stuff come from? Where do we get fibres from? How do we, how do we actually make stuff? And it just, and then I got into this notion of, well, if we have histories, where do our histories come from? And I started to think about, in 1990 was my first trip ever to Jamaica. And I got off the plane and thought, hmm, if there's a, if, if I have histories here, when I met my grandma, my aunties and everything, where does my, how did, how, where did my history come from for this, for textile? So I started to trace my own family tree. So I started to look at, all of the stuff that my grandma made so I could see the textiles my grandma made my aunties made and started to ask questions and I started to collect Caribbean textiles so and this is one of my pieces in my collection wow oh no so nice and this is, this is from amazing. this is from the all sides women's group in Jamaica which was formed in 1936 and they okay. they made textiles there were, rural, there were a rural community who made textiles to support their 
to support themselves. Um, and they are hand in, all hand embroidered, but with rural, rural depictions, and they are beautifully handmade. And when you start to look at histories and start to look at the textiles you see you start to find out where they come from and you start it leads you on all these different pathways of thinking about well where do our textiles come from where do our histories come from who actually brought textiles into the islands then you then you then you go yeah. well actually some of our textiles are, are, are these tacit haptic skills that are brought with us so whilst to make whilst the Africans on the islands of Jamaica and all the Caribbean islands never were brought to the islands, they brought skills with them, but they were also mm -hmm. given things, the enslaved were given tools to actually dress themselves, and that's that's in the slave records. But they also then, as the years went on, they also then created their own skill sets, and then you have the missionaries that came to the islands that gave them, uh, brought additional skills, which then become this kind of melting pot of all these embroideries and textiles. And I just wanted to understand where my histories fitted in with that. And then when my, mm. mom, when my mom came here and all those other ladies came here, they brought with them another set of skills, which ale then became another mishmash, a melting mm. pot. And then you learn about their crochet and how their crochet is starched. And when you look at starched crochet, you, it takes you back to 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 1600s and and Sp Spanish starch crochet. Then you learn about. Um, I started to learn about um, the art of using cassava. Um, cassava is a, is a starched root, and then my mother would my mum then taught me how they actually used to use cassava, grate it, dry it, and then use the powder to actually then starch their crochet. So it would stand up almost like soldiers to attention. But it takes three days to do that kind of thing. And you go, oh, I don't think so. But it takes three days to actually get this starch, this powder that you then use. Yeah. And then they would tell me when they came here in England, they couldn't do that. No. So they had to find some other means. They said, well, we used to boil the water from rice and pour it off and reduce it and do that. Or we'd then go out and buy starch powder and stuff. So all these different things are not written down. So I started to write them down as part of my PhD research. So I then mm. have this massive research about black women and crafting and making. You're following all of these threads and this wonderful exploration yeah. um, of your own heritage. Yeah. Um, and at some point you must have discovered Althea McNish. Yeah, so what I, what I came up with during my research was, well, if all of these black women that came here were doing this amazing kind of, design for their homes and dressing their bodies, dressing their homes, dressing their spaces, working with communities, this must have contributed to a new black aesthetic. And at the same time, I came across Alfie McNeish and thought, but here was this amazing woman dressing British homes, dressing British bodies, designing for the likes of Dior, Balenciaga, Gala Roche, working with amazing British couture designers such as Digby Morton, um, Matt, Giuseppe Matterley. And I'm going, but she was doing this at the same time. And she's a paragraph in my thesis. Mm. And I'm thinking, ah, got to look at this later on, <laughs> somehow. Um, I'll come back to that. You're like, note to self. <laughs> <laughs> and little did you know. And little did I know. And that was kind of like in probably 2013, 14, when she was just mm. a little paragraph. And I just kind mm -hmm. of left it like that. Um, but I first probably came across her in an article in 2005. And that would have been in Crafts magazine. Um, and it was an article by, by, by a historian called Leslie Jackson. And it was called Caribbean Blaze. And it was just all about Althea and her work. And at that time, I actually didn't even know that Althea was still alive because I'd mm. never come across her in all my years at yep. uni and as a tutor. And I'm thinking, mm. how can this woman have done all this work? And yet as a teacher, as a tutor, I'd written textbooks, yep. done articles and thought, how can, how can this woman have been, and this was 2005, so get my maths right, uh, 
57, 67, 77, 87, 97. So 40-odd years she'd been mm -hmm. doing stuff. And yet, as a having been taught in the UK system, having been a teacher in the UK system, I'm thinking, but I don't even know, I didn't even know she existed. And so it becomes, it, 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 I kind of started then to collect information about her and trying to find out. But Google, Google isn't what it was then. Internet wasn't, isn't what it was then. And trying to find any information was kind of, it mm. was difficult. It was, spent a lot of time in libraries. Yes. And their cataloging systems aren't the, weren't the best. <laughs> I think you think I'm uh, I'm younger than than I than I, know. I I I I grew up with libraries and and I but yeah I have a very good memory of, of doing of doing research using the index card system. Yeah, very much remember that. Um, I'm running everyone. And so you gradually built up this picture of the level of impact that that she actually had on the design and the textile. Yeah, I can find you. You just did more and more. Where you're like. Yeah. I just kept finding stuff and, mm. and and I'd go into these these archives well we uh, and, the, and I'd sometimes be met with well we haven't yet we've got stuff but we haven't yet done anything with it mm. or it's there but we we don't have it catalogued yet or it's there or we don't have it we haven't done this can you come back like can you come back next year so it's it's kind of those kind of questions that you keep getting or mm. it's there but it's catalogued wrongly it's oh. not catalogued correctly um or one piece I, I was given it it had her name on it but her name was crossed out and I said but that is an Althea Magnish how do you know that's a, it says so on the salvage of the fabric oh, no. but her name was crossed out on the label and it was it, it was labeled something else um, and, and said, well, how do you know that it's it's her fabric? He says, well, they've got that in the VNA. How do you know? Says, I've seen it. How do you know? Google. <laughs> how do you know? It's there. It's catalogued. It's there. It's there. Yeah. So it's this thing of 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 defending your research. This thing of verifying your research. It's this thing of 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 as a researcher, and even as a black researcher, sometimes just 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 having to verify everything that you do all the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. um, and it's defending your research and it's and it's um acknowledging that that the research that you've got is 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 so profound that people can't believe that it's not been looked at in that way before yeah and it and it stands it stands its test absolutely there was something you said to me, I think when we first talked about it, and you describing the creative genius of Althea. I mean, that yeah. was the first thing you ever said, the first way you ever described her. And just being aware of even a fraction of what she actually did, it is almost unfathomable to understand how something, like a piece of her work could be mislabeled and that you would have to offer so many different sources as a form of validation that it was actually her piece of work. Yeah, I, I, I call her a creative genius because she was able to do her work across so many different mediums. When you start to add up what the mediums that she did, because she started mm. out as a furnishing, she, she, she inherently started out through painting and ser what she calls seriography or, 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 pr or the printing process. So her thing was to master the printing process, the, te yeah. the technicality of the printing process. Because she said she believed that the technicality of the printing process would give her the, the creative practice of designing would 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 give her the freedom to be a, to be the designer she wanted to be, and she then applied that technical practice across a whole series of mediums. So she 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 designed panels for the SS Oriana, um, the, the 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 ship in the nineteen sixties. Um, that sailed between Australia and the UK. So her panels were then on wear right, which is a kind of a, a, a board laminate. 
but instead of having them printed by machine, she painted each of those by hand. So they had this uniqueness about them. So she'd actually been working on this process for a couple of years when she was at the RCA in 57. So that's another, another first, a black woman, textile designer at the RCA, 1957. Uh, ka -ching. Yeah, so big, big one for her. But yes. Yes, the fact that she was doing that work really early on, and it was, a, and and because her in her note she said originally she was interviewed to de design the curtains for the portholes, and by the end of the interview they asked her could she design the 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 um the panels to go in the restaurant car, the restaurant car of the of the of the ship, and for her she said it was the most exhilarating interview she'd ever had but it was also the most frightening and she was she was even wondered if she was up to the job and she she actually sought the advice of Edward Bowden who was one of her tutors at the RCA and she went for it and amazing and and the, she said that was for her that was the turning point in her career she said didn't matter that she'd already got that she'd already been fated by liberties and was already designing for liberties or that she was already designing for asha she thought the pno ss oriana job was the turning point in her career it moved her up from just being a, a textile designer to a designer because a designer was actually higher than a textile designer she thought and it, oh, and it she, gave, put, she put designer above textile designer yeah, yeah. okay because it meant that she could then go for other jobs. And what you then saw her was, she then was designing wallpapers. She then started to design towels. She then started to design laminates. We found out that she designed book covers for Longman. She designed book jackets. She, she then went on, she would go on to design um, interiors for the, for the advanced passenger trains 20 years later. She was designed, mm -hmm. we found out she's designed for London Transport. Um, she went on to design interiors for the Ideal Home exhibition in 1966. She went on to design oh. design for the um, she went on to design another another exhibition for the Ideal Home Ex Ideal Home show in 1969. She went on to design another one in the 1970s. So all of that she felt came off the back of the work from the Oriana. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point, yeah, because then she would probably see by the late 60s that she looked back that that was the real turning point for then yeah. that kind of shift in direction. Um, it's quite interesting. Did she see herself as a designer kind of first and foremost? No, she saw herself as a painter. She always okay. saw herself as a painter and that the work that she did was an extension of her painting. Yeah, because she was very tactile, as you've already said, with her process. She, she would spend yeah. a long time building it up layer by layer. Yeah, her, I mean, her approach, she, she had no fear. If you see the videos that are in the exhibition, that we've, the film footage that we've been able to find, that mm. is very, that's very rare. She had no fear when she was painting. It would, just go, it would just go down. She had this innate sense of how to use colour. And it would just boom, 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 boom. No fear. But she also used the simplest of materials. In one of the pictures that is on the, as you go up the stairs at the landing, one of the pictures shows her using Crayola crayons as her tool on top of her paints. And for me, that is, that just says it all. She's using the simplest of tools to make the best of marks. And you see that crayon -y tool um, or, or oil pastel tool used time and time again. She just yeah. had this way of using, layering her, her tools to get the effect that she wanted. Is that your favourite piece in the exhibition that was at the... William Morris, the picture of her with the crayon. That's one of my favourite pictures because it just shows me that she, it didn't, she used whatever tools were to hand. And yeah. one of her favourite ways of, of, and you see that in things like, the, there's a there's one of her, um, we've got a monoprint from the v &A, which is Painted Desert, which is, mm -hmm. a, the, um, the Painted Desert is an area in America which is a, has these giant cacti. And the monoprint from the V&A is, is a really massive AO monoprint. But then she's translated that into a textile that she did for whole traders called Painted, Painted Desert. Uh, but she's rescaled it. And what she said that she learned when she um, started to design fashion fabrics, how to rescale, because lots of her initial furnishing fabrics were actually giant scaled because 
you've got to remember that what she was designing for postmodern Britain and postmodern Britain had come out of the war and all the new um, buildings that were being made had massive windows, massive spaces, and you had to, your textiles had to fit those spaces. And you see that in some of the wallpapers that she designed as well. They're very dramatic, very bold, very big, very bright. But they had to fit those large spaces. And so mm. in that sense, her, her, her textiles and her initial designs are big, bold and bright and dairy. But then her fashion, her fashion fabrics are much smaller in scale. Mm much more demure and much and the scale is 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 different but she hasn't she doesn't lose that boldness in color and she talks about her use of florals a lot look she actually constantly cross references back to florals in a lot of her work because she loved going to Kew she grew flowers in her garden she 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 was also homesick a lot for Trinidad where she came from and she 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 kept lots of sketchbooks with um floor with 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 images in of plants from trinidad um she would often go to Kew to do to do drawings and we see that in her sketchbooks in the exhibition but she would also keep dried flowers so she would actually okay. she tra she traveled over uh, across europe and she actually brought back lots of flowers but, but she dried them but we found lots of her sketchbooks with dried plants in and she would use those, and you see a lot of her monopers. If you look at um, there's a, there's one of her images is called Rubra, and it, and you see this, this kind of effect, like dry, very sketchy effects, like it's done with a oil pastel, but it it looks like it's almost taken from a dried image, dried flower image. But we knew mm. we know that a lot of her early 1960s. Um, designs are actually influenced from Paris because she spent three she spent a couple of years in Paris and she was influenced by the the impressionist painters like um and she said she was influenced by M Van Gogh and Matisse and those mm -hmm. and you see that in some of the imagery it's very very scripted very very um lots of draw drawn imagery in her in her work and so when you look at the big drawings the way that she draws with lots of fluidity and abandonment yeah. but it's it's very kind of concise as well and she used monoprints a lot as her it's almost like that was her way of photocopying yeah so by monoprinting yeah how she used a slightly more elaborate process than yeah. I suppose on a modern day a modern day photocopier it's really lovely to hear you describe in such a a fierce abandon with colour and size and scale and, and and I suppose and shape and line but then also to have the same artist return to the sketchbook to come back to, um, you know, probably one of the more familiar, the, the, the most kind of, <clears throat> I suppose, almost like a touchstone to a lot of different artists. Yeah. Um, how, can you, off the top of your head, how many, are there quite a few sketchbooks of hers that are in the exhibition? Are there, she, you've mentioned she kept a, a few of them? She kept, she didn't throw anything away. She, were, we, we had choice we had choice there was, there's loads there's at least one off the top of my head there's at least i think there's three in the exhibition but we had more to choose from but we've had limited space so we put one two I think there's three or four in the exhibition okay um but we know that when she went to um, Trinidad in 1962 to do an exhibition she took 163 mm -hmm. pieces of work with her but to illustrate her sketch work this is this is one of her designs oh this beautiful so you can see and this is this is one mm. of the this is one of the designs that's reissued by liberties i i can't remember what the reissued name is from liberties but i know it's called a crana from the original design but you can okay. see the sketch that the sketch like work on it yes you really can see the sketch like quality to her style yeah. absolutely we'll have to find the name for that one and we'll we'll add it in uh if you're watching this back have a look in the description below and we'll we'll have found that name for you yeah i just can't remember the name I no it's I, only I, fine. I, remember I the mean you've name. described a lot of dates and information already so you you have retained so much um yeah. 
um, but she loved poppies. Poppies were one of her favourite flowers, and you'll see poppies <laughs> coming up in her work time and time again. And she loved thistles, and she what she describes it as she would take the thistle and the thistles and poppies and flowers, and she'd give them what she would she described as tropicalizing them. So she would make them give them this tropical feel, and make them mm. different again. So that that's. So you see that, you see, that's a recognised signature of her work, this notion of taking things from the English countryside and yeah. doing and tropicalising them. Um, and you see it again in this piece of work. This is called Gila. Um, and you're probably wondering, oh, Rose, have you got people? Yes, I've got several pieces of Alfie McNeish, which I've started <laughs> collecting ages ago. You brought some materials. With oh, look at those colours. I don't think this is going to do justice to, no, it isn't. to that. It's on this Instagram. is called, called Gila and it's by Hull Traders but it, it's an amazing mm. floral it's just full of colour and we know from some of the research we've done some of her pieces contains 23 colours just layered on top of each other yeah in a, in a print so we, we found that, and like, yeah, yeah. some of her pieces contain 23 colours and you and I know Elena that very few printers would allow you to do 23 colours. This is traditional printing, hand screen printing. How many printers do you know today would allow you to put 23 colours into a design, into production? It was a really good design. <laughs> <laughs> um, that um, really said a lot about uh, maybe not only possibly her conviction of what she wanted to do, how good the quality was, but maybe also, you know, the faith they had in being able yeah. to make them. She had a, such an impressive client list. And you've already mentioned Liberty, we've got Dior and Heels. And I mean, you know, we, we went to this at the beginning, but there were other designers at the time. You know, you've got Sandra Rhodes and Celia Burtwell. Um, and the fact that Althea isn't the household name that you've touched upon, even with the clients that she worked with, and also her being such an inspiration to to the black community at the time, even though they were a small part of the, of the yeah. population. You know, are you, is your hope that the exhibition, that all the conversation around the exhibition and the fact that already it's going to a second uh, bigger uh, gallery, that this is the beginning of being able to maybe make those corrections? Yeah, and I think it's already having an impact because when you look at, when you look at every, all, the webs, all, the, all the museum spaces that actually have her collection, if you look at if you if you look in the archives as before this exhibition, yeah, and look on their websites before this exhibition because you know that websites can be ar archived. Yeah, look at their Internet websites. archive is a very useful tool. Yeah, look at their yeah. websites before this exhibition and look at their websites yeah. after this exhibition when this exhibition mm -hmm. started and look at how they changed their content. Interesting. And or maybe they just want they were like maybe we should just double check in case we have enough <laughs> like, in the collection. Yeah, and look at how they've changed their content since this exhibition yeah. has gone up. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, lots of them have, changed, have corrected their information um, yeah. in terms of when she was born. Lots of them have corrected their information on... We can um, come back to the stories around when she was born. Yeah. In um, a <laughs> lots of them have corrected their information about certain of the textiles, the, yeah. the information on all different aspects of her work have all been changed because they've actually because we've actually put that information in the exhibition we've we've given mm -hmm. we've sent people on a journey about her her voices in the exhibition through the videos we've sent mm -hmm. we've shown people this is what this designer had the capability to do and people have been taken on a journey to mm -hmm. about her and what we wanted to tell people was this is her life before she came to England and this is her life when she came to England. And she had this, she, she moved between these two spaces time and time again. But she mm. was a confident 26 year old when she came here. She was, yes. already, she was already a confident woman and she knew what she wanted to do. She knew she didn't mm. want, she got a scholarship to go to the Architectural Association College. I mean, that was, that was a big thing. But she, she, she said, she said, she, she, she turned said it was a man's job. That's what she said. It was a man's job. And she didn't think it was going to be for her. And okay. she said, commercial, she thought commercial, commercial design, as it was called then, or graphic design was going to be the thing. But 
what we what you have to recognize she also went to evening classes so she was doing this day class mm -hmm. of commercial design and went to evening class to do textiles wow so she was doing the two together i mean that could not have been an easy juggle no it could not have been easy at all and and that's how she met eduardo palazzi and then she met this lovely woman called Miss Batty, who was the tech, one of the textiles geniuses at Central School at the time. And that's what helped her to get into, get the scholarship to get into the RCA. So yeah. that, that, that mixture of, of stuff, if you like, um, and mm. what we were able to show in the exhibition was student, what student life was like for her at the time. So people got to see what her life was like through her eyes, through her photographs. And that, mm. I think, is the thing about seeing her as a person, not just as the designer. Um, Absolutely. And, I think sometimes it's very easy to let someone's skill and talent and what they've created yeah. almost eclipse their, their origins and who they were as an actual person and what their actual experiences were. And that's always a a, a, a balance for the time. Yeah. And, and if you don't know what she looks like, I think some, some people might not have seen her, but there's a Great picture of I love guys. that photograph of her. She looks so happy. She's just stood there holding these two amazing designs on either yeah. side and it just has the biggest <laughs> smile on her face. So what you see on on that on one side is Chabolus, which was okay. obviously that, that fabric has been re that's a Liberty fabric and that was redone in the new in the new fabrics that Liberty reissues. And Chabolus means Spanish in onion means onions in Spanish, sorry. And the other fabric is uh, Trinidad by Heels. Oh, lovely. Um, and that was one of her first fabrics for Heels. So, and then she's surrounded by all her artwork. Mm. That's a lovely photograph. Um, and then for me, it's, um, and that's her first design for Liberties Marina, and you can see that crayony, mm. that crayony design, that use of texture. Absolutely. And this for me, uh, I don't know if you can see that one properly, is her in her studio. Oh wow. So you were saying before in the beginning it was very difficult to really have a clear idea of where, you know, you were trying to piece together where she'd been and you were using original sources and going to libraries and then it, it seems that once you were able to uh, have access to her studio and her own, um, I suppose, sketchbooks and archives, as you said, she never threw anything away, that probably gave you so much more information and so much more to work with in order to, to be able to yeah. tell that story and track that journey. I think what what I think what I've been able to do by amassing the newspaper articles, because there were quite a lot of newspaper articles written about her in the West Indian press, mm -hmm. what was what was termed the West Indian press at the time, um from from the Jamaican Gleaner, West Indian Chronicles, West Indian mm -hmm. Gazette. Um, yeah. Then also things like the Guardian, the Daily Mail, Evening Standard, all of these newspapers had written about her, but it, it took a lot of literally hours mm -hmm. of just sitting down and searching to find yeah. and then putting them all together. And then you get this picture of her, this notion that she enlivened the, 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 the various, brought sunshine, brought whatever it, it it was and you get these you get these um one article that made made me smile was that women were rushing into liberties to buy this fantastic these fantastic fabrics by this amazing designer Alfie McNeish but they weren't buying the furnishing fabrics to put on furniture they're buying the furnishing fabrics to dress themselves so this notion <laughs> that um and, and she herself talks about this fact that she was sick and tired of seeing women dressed in flower pots she wanted them to be dressed in flowers so one of her one of her first designs that were produced for Asha, Zika Asha, one of the famous kind of fashion entrepreneurs, was that she created this design called Tropic. And it's these amazing, lush, large flowers. Mm. And she did it so the women could be draped in flowers, but the fabric was in this luscious silk that just literally designers did it and it just draped the body exotically. And it's like, 
yeah, it was it was the thing in spring 1959, 1960, in all the kind of in all the magazines, um, and it was used by like Guy Laroche. So it was in French Vogue in in June, July 1959. It was mm. used by Guy Matterly as one of his designs. So all these, all these Giuseppe Matteli, sorry, not Guy Matteli, but Giuseppe Matteli, and it, and and you start to see this this amazing her work is just going from strength to strength, um, in all these in all these different areas. Yeah. You said before that the poppy was one of her favourite flowers, and she loved thistles, and what she really liked to do, and I really liked the way that she would take these British, or I suppose you know maybe kind of. <clears throat> the plant life and the botanicals that you saw in Britain or in America, but then we would place them with these really bright tropical backgrounds and have such a wonderful contrast. Um, and you have a quote on the wall of the exhibition, which, you know, obviously really kind of lands on the head with that. Everything I did, I saw through a tropical eye, which really wonderfully, you know, links into how her work in, like, incorporates those influences from the Caribbean as well as from Britain. You know, how do you think that she was able to extract elements of those different cultures to really infuse that design and te te textile practice, or she was just experimenting with different shapes and forms and colours and seeing? What I, came th I think, and that and that also comes from a a lot of that comes from comes from discussions with her husband John as well. Um, I, okay. I think, I think John Vice, he was he was as much an influence with her but I think part of part of this was because she what we've got to remember is that there weren't any that Alfie came here before independence in Trinidad so before there was any kind of big university in that you could actually study art and design at so for a mm -hmm. lot of the, the early writers artists and stuff for them to actually get that further education in design or art or whatever they had to move Trinidad was a colony. They had to move from mm -hmm. the colony to the colonizer to get that extra education. And for her to make her career, she couldn't. She said she just said that she couldn't go back to Trinidad to do that. There was mm -hmm. there wasn't a, there wasn't a place for her to do to get to to keep that work momentum. She would go back to Trinidad to do exhibitions and to do talks and tours, but she couldn't she couldn't sustain her living there. It had to yeah. be here. Okay. So, in all, but she was homesick. But and one of the things that you'll find in all of her work, every piece of work is actually named, and it and she cross references back to Trinidad, and the Caribbean all the time, and mm. she she collect flowers. Um, there's there's a reference that um, when the Queen went to did the tour in 1966 in Trinidad, they actually took one of the residences there. They created that for the Queen and Prince Philip. And what they actually they commissioned Althea to design the fabric that would decorate the residence. But they sent the flowers from Trinidad, the air freighted the flowers from Trinidad to the UK so she could design the, the fabric to be then shipped back to Trinidad. Mm -hmm. That's how much she was recognised for her work. Mm -hmm. um, and Amazing. it was the National Flower of Trinidad. They didn't have it here that she could actually use. So they shipped it, uh, air freighted it over so she could design the fabric and ship it back. So this notion of how she was, how good she was at doing her work was already recognised in that kind of nearly nine years that she'd already been working as yeah. a designer. It, it, she had that recognition as a designer. So not just a textile designer, but a designer. Yes, which was a diff an important difference that she liked to make. Yeah, that's what she liked to make, that difference. And what we then find out by 1966, she was also invited to be a member of the Caribbean Artist Movement, which was a British, which was technically a British art movement made up of a range of black artists, writers that were that were wanted recognition within Britain that that they were that they were contributing to a black to a black aesthetic, to a black British aesthetic here in Britain. Mm. And that black British art was here to stay. And it was making a contribution to the art movement per se. Mm. And they wanted to introduce a black audience and a white audience to what British art was about. Black British art was about in a big, in a bigger, in a bigger way. And she was the only female for a number of years in that group. And she was invited as part of that. And she, and she would, um, 
showcase her work, both her murals, her textiles, her design work as part of that group. And she was she was very um, much a part of that whole scene. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you said before that she about something about how um, was it Black British art isn't happening now. It it happened years ago, and that was something that you wanted to to that has been something you've talked about relating back to the the exhibition. Uh, and we've touched upon how Althea had such amazing breadth. It wasn't you know she was doing couture, but she was also her work was on the high street. People were having her designs in their homes and they were having it on their clothes as well. Um, how would you say that she has influenced designers uh, of today? Oh, Even gosh. subconsciously. Can you, can you quickly encapsulate that? <laughs> I, I know to, that's a big question. But... I, would, I would have to say that her, her influence lies in the, the fact that she challenged, she challenged the use of colour as, an, as, an, as a way of um, she challenged how we used how we used and influ the influence and the use of color in our in our in our design spaces. Um, mm. How we how we might influence the use of color. So, for instance, I know that she designed the what was called Cavendish textiles, which was part of John Lewis's, and you can't get more every day than John Lewis's, can you? Nope. So, um, and in especially in the nineteen sixty six Ideal Home exhibition, one of her fabrics called Lumiere was actually showcased in the, the Girl About Time room. And that fabric would have been on release eight weeks after the show. So consumers mm -hmm. would have been able to have gone to John Lewis's and bought that fabric to decorate their home. And you've got to remember that that show was the first to be showcased in colour on BBC Two. That's so consumers would have had the chance to see that in colour, to see what it would look like. And then eight weeks later, go and see it, go and buy it themselves but also 1966 on 1966 when you look in the eyes when you look in various magazines it was the time when the consumer was taught what was good taste what was what was good design and lots of the fabrics were showcased in the run-up to the ideal home show and then for the next six months this is what you might be buying for your home this is how you can decorate your home this is how you can see your home so she was she was a dictator of taste yeah uh, but people didn't know that because it was it wasn't sold necessarily with her name on. It was sold as oh, yeah. this is the design by Cavendish or this is the design by Warped Manufacturer. This is the design by. So depending on which magazine it was aimed at, it would be, it would be how it was sold. Yeah. So if you were in the heels or habit heels market or whole traders, it would it, it would, everything has her name on. So you were the you were the well healed and you would you would know that that was Alfie McNish and you'd be buying it. But if you were the, from the everyday market, mm. you would necessarily be be buying that from that from from you'd be you'd be buying that because that was be the thing that you saw in the in the in the latest home magazine if you like. But you wouldn't know it was Alfie McNish because it wouldn't have it wouldn't have her name on it. But you'd mm. buy it because you'd saw it in the magazine. So not every store would automatically use her name, but by association of the fact that the designs have been in the show. Yeah. She automatically had, well, her designs had that level of, of recognition. Yeah, and she'd, Which, and she'd, yeah, and she'd be working. Yeah. And, and, she, and, and she'd be working. And the thing is, we've got, we've got to recognise as well, she, she, actually won a, she actually won an award in 62, 63 to spend three months going around Europe, looking at the trends around all the major European um print print houses so she knew what was going on in europe she was aware of the trend she was aware of the technologies um and she worked for quite a few european manufacturers as well um she even designed ski wear and skiing was one of her loves she was going skiing in 1950s europe 1960s europe she went skiing and she talks about going skiing in a white she has a, i saw a picture of her in a white ski suit and she looks yeah. amazing of course she would. She looked like a model. <laughs> of course she would. Um, Did you say that she also ended up designing ski wear? Yeah, she designed in the nineteen eighties. We found a we found a we found a, a a note that she was designing ski wear. Loved it so much. And and you just go, oh okay. 
and you, and you just got you just go yeah why not she loves skiing yeah and and you, and you maybe go, there was something that she really wanted to find and she's like i'm not finding it i'm just gonna make it myself yeah so, so but she was designing it for an eastern european ski ski manufacturer uh, fabric manufacturer so her fabric was actually in production so somebody somewhere was actually wearing an Althea McNeish original fabric a ski wear and didn't even know it that's fantastic um but for me probably the the thing that sticks in my in my head um one of the and once one of the pieces in the in the magazine was that in 1963 in Vogue they named her as a rising star a fresh breath of air they called her a rising star fresh breath of air and so mm. here is this fantastic designer in Vogue. She's not a model. She's she's a professional black woman designer being named as the fresh breath of fresh air. And that for me just, oh, yeah. One of your favourite things. It's one of my favourite things. And, it, and, and I've got a copy of it. That's my copy that's in the, that's in the exhibition. That's fantastic. So coming back to the exhibition. Yeah. You had to make a lot of decisions and choices as the curator. Uh, you know, you already said that you took you took people through uh, that story and that journey of of her life, um, as much as wanting to share the work that, that she ended up making. Um, are you quite excited at the options that are then going to be presented to you with the uh, you know the, just the, I suppose the, the the space and scale that the Whitworth is going to offer? Yeah, I think people. I think one of the things that we'll be able to showcase lots more is what the Whitworth has in terms of like wallpapers and some of the other fabrics. Because mm. um, they're in the actual Whitworth collection, aren't they? Yeah, because they're in the Whitworth collection. So, the, and obviously the space. So people will be able to mm. see even more of what Alfie is able to design. We'll be able to share a bit more um, with her, with other, with, with some of the other works. So, so people can see how she sits alongside other artists as well and other designers who were her who was designing likewise with her and yes. how her work sits but also it gives them a chance to see more breadth of her work so mm. whilst we've only got small kind of squares of wallpaper they're able to see the wallpaper in lengths and that mm. makes a big difference to see a length of her wallpaper i tell you my, my it took my breath away when i saw when I saw some of them and they look so different it's like ah oh, right okay I didn't see that coming so big surprise yeah. and going back to what you were saying before about the scale that she would work to yeah I think yeah if you're trying to make that reduce it down to the uh, uh, you know a, a section as opposed to you know a full piece that yeah. would be but also be it's, it's, it's things like can you spot her signature and I'm going to tell you you can't <laughs> you can't it, it's not her signature is not spotable it's deliberately it's, kind of, it's it's i think she she made it deliberate not to spot her signature but it's in there somewhere but it's in there somewhere and and some of the work has the lightest of touch you would not have thought that is an alfie mcneish it's it's it she has this touch she can go from bright and bold to soft and pastel in a hit and you go okay i i get i she understands color in its finite range mm. of of everything that's of its entirety and mm. it's like i don't i don't know if you can see this oh wow this is one of her scarves for um this was designed for boac and it's meant to be birds flying in formation Oh, I see that. But you can start to see, even on this, how the cut, how she just uses colour in mm. so many different ways. Yes. So I think when we when we talk about colour, we have to think about colour not just being bright and bold, but mm. in its infinite ways of going from bright and bold to soft and calm. And she, yeah. she has, it's like going from a, a, a shade to a tint. That's a really interesting thing to say. A shade to a tint. I like uh, that. Yeah. So, and, or going from a, um, yeah, shade to a tint is that I think is, the, is what I want to think about. How you go from a shade to a tint. And then in those kind of contexts, think about 
what does that mean when you're when you're looking at color on a on a on a color spectrum when you're trying to go from the palest of colors to the darkest or from the brightest to the to to the other end and that's what she does with color she it blows your mind i could sit and think about that for a while but we <laughs> <laughs> Watching. Um, so the exhibition is moving from London and coming closer to, to you in the north. Uh, what would your dream exhibition destination place be? If it could go anywhere, where would you love? Oh gosh. Go? Oh gosh. Well, I did. Um, there was an article done for the Scottish um, Homes Home Interiors magazine. So mm -hmm. it would be nice for it to go to Scotland. And then, do you know what? It'd be nice for it to go to Trinidad or somewhere in the Caribbean. Lovely if it went. Yeah, that would be lovely. Because I think that would be that would be that would be that would be really nice. Um, and I'd like it to go somewhere where there's another diaspora, diaspora, or even somewhere like Japan or Korea or something like that. Yeah, that would be really fascinating. Just thinking about the use of color or design and textile. Yeah. Because she loved to travel, mm. she loved to travel, mm. and she and she and she. One of her favorite places was Mexico. She said in the notes, one of my favorite places to travel was Mexico. She loved Mexico, mm. and the and the Americas. So, so, oh gosh, it's like putting a pin in my map, isn't it? And going, where would you're I like gonna to get go? a map out there, and you're like, right, I'm gonna put pins in. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's a, I think, I think taking it to places where there's a, there's a, there's a large diaspora. Um, like Canada or or obviously mm -hmm. lots of people say the States, but I, I think some place like Canada where there's a large diaspora. Because they did they did actually have there was a um we did find some film footage of her at the Montreal there was a there was a big thing in Montreal um mm -hmm. in nineteen sixty seven, like one of these big um oh gosh, what do they call them? They have these big um shows. Like an and, expo? Yeah, Expo, that was it. And there was one in Montreal and she and the Trinidad and Tobago um um had one. Trinidad had, had a stand and her work was actually in there. So it'd be nice to take it back to Montreal or something like that and kind of mm. showcase her work there. So something in Canada would be would be great, I think. I don't know, it's like so I many wonderful put, put, put a pin in the map and go, Yeah, it's it's here, it's it's ready. But um yeah. I think I think Trinidad because that's where her artwork started. That's where her art life started, and mm. and and taking it back to her spirit. I call it a spiritual home with the Trinidad Art Society and all of that kind of stuff. I think that would be really that would be really significant for me. I think. I think that would be a really wonderful thing to 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 do to have the exhibition go back go back home really to a certain degree. Um, seven o'clock, but we can we, we can go for for a little bit longer. I realised I meant to ask if anyone watching has any questions. <laughs> um, you're welcome to put them in, and we can do our best and see what we can do. I mean, I can also send them to you, Rex, and see if you uh, would like to share anything. But um, what I wanted to just ask now is that you are also uh, you you went from having a short paragraph on Althea in your. PhD, thesis, yeah. In your thesis, uh, but you've been working on something a little bit longer that's that's going to come out in twenty twenty four. Yes, so I'm now working longer. on the book. Book? I knew there was a book. book. So little did book. you know that there was going to be dissertation and a book. Yeah, so the book, the book is due to the is always it was always in my in my plan to work on the book for twenty twenty four, and the reason for twenty twenty four is because that would be she would. It would be her centenary. She'd be a hundred in twenty. Had she been alive, she'd be a hundred in twenty twenty four. And mm -hmm. so, for me, that that's a significant time to bring the book because it's reflective, it's reflexive, and it allows me time to pull together the depth mm -hmm. of research and to give it the give it the reverence that it's due. I didn't want to do it too fast because it would. It's, it's it's not something that can be done that fast and with two shows in between it's not it's not possible to do to write mm -hmm. and do two so exhibitions far. um and i think the book the book needs time 
yeah. to pull together the body of research that it it there is and the pictures and the images so i want it to be full of images and color and get all the facts straight and all the content done and it's and i want it to be good <laughs> which is very important you know i completely appreciate as, a, as an academic in design that you would like it to be it would be really good um no i'm sure that'll be absolutely wonderful uh so 2024 everyone make a note yeah, May 2024. Uh, be... May 2024 yes, so... is going to be out in time for a birthday. Out in time for, and, for her birthday. And we've just had some news that there is going to be a blue plaque, a blue plaque erected for her. Um, oh, that's amazing. So there's so where she used to live. So we're just waiting for confirmation, but a blue plaque is is coming as well. Is that near where she lived, or would that be near her studio? It's her, her studio was where she lived. So one. A few oh, okay. Months, so in Tottenham, so listen out for announcements soon. So Fantastic. we just heard that blue plaque's going to be erected. So that's brilliant. So that would be really. And then we'll also see what happens after for the Whitworth and where it's going to go to next. Yes. So we're, we're we're looking out, we're listening, and we're looking out. But yeah, she's she she is amazing. She's an amazing tour de force. Um, mm. And the thing that she left with me was that she opened doors for others to follow. So for all those young aspiring designers out there, look at her work, look at what she did, look at what she um, accomplished. And she talks about going into a room with 200, she said she, talk, she walked into a room and there was 200 men in gray suits and she was the only woman. And she just said, you've got to get on with it. Um, so um, yeah. And then said another woman joined. So another woman joined, joined and said, and there was two women and I didn't feel alone yeah. anymore. So this notion yeah. that she was always just sometimes the only one in the room, but mm. she said that it was her passion of textiles and design and painting that drove her. And those are the things that she just focused on all the time. She knew her work and she knew her stuff and she just got on with it. But she said that she opened doors for others to follow. So for those out there that want to follow your dreams just follow them that they're the things that give you your passion and um, yeah. the things that drive you um i remember being a 14 year old in my art class and my art teacher saying you could have a career in this and i went home and told my mom and my mom said if that's what you want to do and i know that that wasn't the norm because i come from a very conservative for those out there that know about church and some of you will know about what i mean when i said church I come from a very, mm -hmm. I came from a very conservative upbringing, so this notion that I could go to art school, which is not seen as the thing to do, but I could go to art school and have this career in art and design and be what I, and do what I want to do and passion. It's it's where it's brought me where I am today. So go for go for what drives you. Go for your passion. Life's too short. Oh, absolutely. We 100 percent, 100 percent support that that message. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation about amazing women. So we've had Rose Sinclair, Althea McNish, and Rose Sinclair's mum, who and your art teacher. So all of these wonderful women championing uh, the next generation and uh, opening doors for for others to follow. So do put your hand down for the next generation of artists, designers in whatever form, and and bring them along with you for the for the ride. Yeah. People. And drawing does do drawing does change lives because that's that's what I started doing when I was little. I started to draw as well, and drawing was the thing that allowed me to just escape. And drawing is one of those things that you can just you just you don't need any technology. You just take your pencil and a book, or a crayon, or a crayon, or a crayon, or a crayon, a crayon. You don't need any technology to draw. Crayon, a crayon, yeah. and a pencil and a book, and off you go. I hope that has inspired everyone joining us. Thank you so much for Thank sticking you, with us past seven o'clock. It's been lovely chatting with you, Rose. Thank you so much for yeah. giving us your time during this incredibly busy period. Best of luck with yeah. the Whitworth. I'm sure it's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, I, I can imagine you having a most wonderful time going through the wallpaper uh, collection. You're going to have... Yeah. This so is my fun. wallpaper behind you. This is one of my designs for my front room. So when I do my research... That's I'm your like, design? Yeah. Wow. Well. So I make front mm. rooms with textiles. That's fantastic. I was going to ask paper. you. I was going to ask you about that. But then there were some technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we made it. But we made it. 
Thank you very much, everyone, for joining Thank us. You. Have wonderful evenings, days, mornings, wherever you are. And um, if you've just joined us, don't worry. You can watch this back in just a moment. It will be added to our Instagram account, and we will also add it to our YouTube in a few days' time. My name is Eleanor, and I'm the Projects and Communications Manager at The Big Draw. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we'll see you next time. Yeah, and I'm signing up as well. Rose Sinclair. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody.